Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. In this show, we're going to be talking about prospecting for trout, or techniques that you can use when you don't see any trout feeding. It's always challenging to approach a new trout stream, and it's often intimidating, but it's a fun challenge. But where do you start, and where do you go from there on your journey to figure out the puzzle? In this show, I'm going to give you tips on how to do your homework, how to approach a river, how to pick the right fly, and how to fish it, all on your own. Oh yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly, and you're gonna have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery. One of the great things about trout fishing is exploration. In this show, we're gonna teach you how to start your journey. You can start this months in advance. Do a web search on the river. Look for online fishing reports. If there's a fly shop in the area, call or email them and ask them for advice. But make sure that once you arrive, you visit the shop and buy something. You should ask about the specific season you're fishing as well as good locations, public access, and what flies they recommend. And also, your own expectations. Tell them what you're looking for. Many areas also have great guidebooks on trout streams. Most of these talk about seasonal changes and most have excellent maps showing public access areas. Google Earth can help on bigger rivers. You'll be able to see riffles and pools, roads for access, and where there are bends in a river. Bends are always good because deep pools are usually found in a bend in a river's course. In North America, we have vast public resources, and in most places, it's easy to find a place to fish. But in some states, the landowner can own the bottom of the river, and you're not allowed to even walk the river through their property. In other states and provinces, you're able to walk the river and its banks to the high water mark, even through private land. To learn how the different states and provinces handle access rights on rivers, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers has produced a report that shows how these laws vary by state, and it's available as a resource in the Orvis Learning Center. Even if the land is privately owned, some landowners are glad to give you permission if you ask politely in person. If you do get permission, make sure you close livestock gates behind you. And it's not a bad idea to take a garbage bag with you and clean up what others have left behind. Don't forget to leave a little gift after fishing if you've been given permission to fish private land. Sometimes a little refreshment will work wonders. If the posted signs are not plainly marked with the name and address of the landowner, there are other ways to research private land. There are apps to discover the true landowner and public land and these can also be found with a web search. So when you're prospecting for trout, the last thing you wanna do is jump right in the river and start fishing. It's a new river, you don't know what's going on, you don't know where the fish are. It's really good to get an overview of as much of the river as you can before you start fishing. So I'm standing here on a bluff and I've got all kinds of great water in here, a lot of variety. And I'm gonna stand here for a few minutes and look at the water. Maybe I'll see a rise. I'll look at the different water types, decide what I wanna fish, figure out maybe where the fish are gonna be holding, and then go down and get in the water. You know, one of the things I'd really urge you to do is don't get in the water where somebody else is fishing. Um, I would love to fish that run up there at the head of that pool. That's the kind of place I really like to start. But I'm not gonna go there because there's people there already. Give people space on the river. I've got miles of river 
where there's no people here, and I'm not gonna go up and bother those people. There's another advantage to that. If you go to a stretch of water where there hasn't been somebody fishing, you're probably gonna have better fishing because the fish aren't spooked. Nobody's been wading and casting over them for an hour. Take a walk or drive along a river looking for interesting water that doesn't already have anglers in it. You may wanna watch our videos on reading the water to find the most likely places. If you're not experienced at finding trout, one of the things I would recommend is that you watch our video on reading the water before you go out and prospect. You know, when I'm prospecting for trout, I like to look for a place with a variety of water types because I don't know where the fish are gonna be. So I look for a place with some fast water, with some slow water, with some big rocks, with some bends in the river. Any place where there's more structure, the more chances of finding fish there. And since you don't know what kind of water they're gonna be in, if you've got a lot of variety in front of you, you've got a lot of places to explore. I like to start out at the head of a pool if I can. Trout always live there and are eager to feed, and the broken water hides your approach. Plus, in faster current, trout don't have a chance to look over your fly too well and need to make snap decisions. At first, until you learn more, here are some places to avoid. Long stretches of shallow water. Flat, featureless water can be productive, but it's difficult to figure out where to start unless the fish are rising. Very fast water with no protection from the current. These places might prove to be better than they look at first, and you may find a hidden gem. But when first starting out, you need to raise the odds. When you're looking for trout, you want to look for water that's moving at about one foot per second. You need to kind of estimate that. Maybe throw something in the water, just watch something float down, and try to figure out what one foot per second is. No easy way. It's about the speed of a slow walk. But once you learn to recognize that, that current speed, you'll be able to find trout more easily because that's the kind of water they're going to tend to be lying in and feeding in. Um, it's easy on the surface when you're dry fly fishing or fishing a hatch. Not so easy under the water because you, you don't know what the hydraulics are doing underwater and you don't really know what one foot per second is. But if you look at those surface currents, you'll learn to recognize that and it'll help you find trout. One additional thought about prospecting for trout. You never know what changes in the weather might bring and you should explore no matter what the weather is. You know, these days there's no reason not to go fishing no matter what the weather is. I mean, with modern rainwear, insulated underwear, and a wool hat, um, you can stay pretty darn comfortable even in a miserable day like this. It's 40 degrees, it's windy, it's raining, but there's nobody else on this beautiful pool on Grand Lake Stream in Maine. This is a prime part of the season and probably the best pool on the river. There's nobody else here but us. Okay, you've done your homework. You're here on a new river with a rod, reel, and line. What's next? You probably want to know what fly to pick. You never know for sure what flies trout will respond to. You hopefully already did your research on what flies to bring, but in case you didn't, or you could not find any information, here are 10 trout flies that should work anywhere in the world. I would never go trout fishing without these. A black woolly bugger in either a beadhead or a tungsten conehead version in sizes 6 through 10 is what I tie on when I have no idea what fly will work. You can cover a lot of water with a streamer and you can fish this fly with action by stripping in line or even dead drift with no action just like a nymph. It might look to a trout like a big nymph, a crayfish, or a baitfish. Like many great flies, it looks like lots of trout prey. The Parachute Adams in sizes 12 through 16 is a great dry fly to use when you don't know what the trout are taking, or even when you do. It just works. No one knows exactly why it works so well to match a variety of insects, but there's no arguing with its long history of success. It's the most popular dry fly in the world. The Copper John Nymph in sizes 12 through 18 is a flashy nymph that sinks quickly and is a great imitation of stonefly and mayfly nymphs. It's popular in copper, red, and chartreuse. Don't worry so much about having it in several colors. You're better off with a variety of sizes than a range of colors. An orange or tan stimulator dry fly in sizes 10 through 14 
is a big bushy dry fly that's great to use on a dry dropper rig as an indicator. But it also imitates big caddisflies, stoneflies, moths, and even grasshoppers. If small mayflies are abundant, there's no better nymph than a pheasant tail in sizes 14 through 18. There is just something magical about this pattern. There are times when you need a tiny nymph, and there are days when nothing else will work. The zebra midge in sizes 16 through 20 covers a host of smaller insects. If you see midges in the air or on the water but no rises, fishing a zebra midge is a smart move. When trout are feeding on a hatch of emerging mayflies, my go-to pattern is a sparkle done in yellow or olive in sizes 14 through 18. This is an especially good pattern for smooth water and when trout get fussy and selective. You'll see many hatches of small olive mayflies on trout streams, and there are numerous species that hatch all year long. Sometimes the trout don't want anything else, so having a bluing olive dry fly in sizes 14 through 22 will ensure that you don't get caught off guard. Next to mayflies, caddisflies are the most important trout stream insect. The elk hair caddis in tan, sizes 14 through 18, will do the trick when you see caddis flies on the water. It floats well and probably also imitates small terrestrial insects. I know people love to fish grasshopper imitations, but you only find them later in the season. If I had only one terrestrial pattern to pick, it would be a black foam beetle in sizes 14 and 18. They work throughout the season, even during hopper time. You may have a box full of flies, but you still need some clues to pick one. What's hatching? Are there flies in the air or on the water? Check spider webs for what has hatched over the past couple days. Lighted doors and gas station lights at night also attract insects, so make sure to check them the night before. Shake some streamside bushes. Recently hatched insects will be clinging to them. Turn over a few rocks to get an idea of the general size and shape of the aquatic larvae in the water. You won't need an exact match to fool fish. Just try to get the general size and shape as close to the naturals as possible. Look for the size and shape of baitfish and crayfish in the shallows. Pick a fly. The worst that can happen is you'll have to change it. The leader you pick is as important as the fly pattern. Where do you start? As a general rule of thumb, for most rivers at moderate water levels, a nine foot leader is the best place to start. But what tippet size? Well, once you decide what fly to start with, you should match the tippet size of your leader to the fly size. Here's a general guideline to follow. And if you don't want to memorize a chart, just divide your fly size by three and round it off to get the right tippet size. If the water is low and clear, if you can see most of the rocks on the bottom, it might be a good idea to go with a 12-foot leader. Fly lines landing close to trout in clear water can scare them, and a 12-foot leader keeps your fly line further from the fish. In small streams, or if the water's really dirty, you may get away with a 7.5-foot leader, or even shorter if you decide to fish a streamer on a sink tip line. You might not have a full selection of leaders with you. Because you're on your own, you'll need to master the craft of rebuilding a leader, and it's not that hard. Let's say you start with a small dry fly and you're using a nine foot 5X leader, but it isn't working. You decide you want to fish a streamer and need a shorter, stiffer leader to handle the bigger fly. In this case, it's easy to just cut back your tapered leader to a heavier section. Hold your spool of 2X, which you decided is the best tippet for that size eight streamer alongside your leader. Eyeball where the leader looks about the same diameter and cut it here. You can either tie your streamer on right here or you can add a short piece of 2x tippet material if you want. It's a little trickier when you need a lighter tippet, either when you go to a smaller fly or when your knotless leader gets too heavy from repeated fly changes. So I need to modify my leader. I started with a 12 foot 5X a couple days ago and I've tied on a whole bunch of flies and it's now way too heavy to fish 5X and dry flies. So I don't need a micrometer or anything like that. All I have to do is take the end of my leader where I know it's too thick and hold it up against my tippet spools and uh, eyeball it and it looks like about 2X. So what I'm gonna do is tie on about a six to eight inch piece of 3X. 
then a six to eight inch piece of 4X, and then my 5X tippet. So I'll be back to somewhere around a 12 foot 5X liter. When you're fishing on your own, it's easy to forget about stealth, but you'll need a careful approach, not only in your wading, but also in your casting. Let's visit casting guru, Pete Kutzer, for some tips on making your casts stealthier. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today, I wanna to talk to you about making a stealthy presentation to a trout in a tricky situation. Chances are, if you can see the fish, a predator can see that fish. So we need to make a stealthy approach if we're gonna get our fly to that fish and hopefully catch it. Here's a couple things that may help you. The first is when we see our fish and we know how far away it is, and we have to make a couple false casts to gauge our distance, do it off to the side, over here. Notice I'm making my false cast away from this fish. I can gauge my distance, then I can make my delivery and send my fly out. The second thing we wanna make sure that we do is that we don't crash our fly down onto the water. If we crash our fly down onto the water, that fly landing like a cannonball is an unnatural presentation. And that fish may not like that. We wanna try and get that fly to land nice and softly. And to do that, we wanna make a good stop coming straight forward right around eye level. That's gonna get that line to extend and then we can lower it down gently to the water. Think of it like throwing a dart. You send it straight out rather than down to the ground. Straight out and then we're just gonna float that fly down to the fish. That's how you can get a nice delicate presentation. So if you try that, a sidearm cast, don't false cast too much over the fish, false cast to the side of the fish, get that good stop and then float that fly down and don't cast beyond it, I'm sure you'll find some fish in tricky situations more capable to catch or more easily caught. So let's get fishing. Should you start with a streamer, dry, or nymph? If you see fish rising, the logical choice is a dry. But if you don't see any rising, what do you do? I can't tell you the answer to that, and you won't know either. Sometimes all of them may work, and at times perhaps nothing will work. You should dig in and try something. Water temperature can affect what flies you use. Trout are cold-blooded, and at water temperatures under 50 degrees, they are not likely to chase a fly or rise to the surface. My first option, if the water is relatively clear and above 50 degrees, would be a dry dropper combination or perhaps swinging a wet fly. If the water is high and dirty, I might start with a streamer. And if it's early in the season and the water is cold but clear, I might start with a Euro nymph rig. Prospecting for trout in a new river requires a lot of moving around. When you decide to move, regardless of what method you choose, should you work upstream or down? It's not hard to fight the current and because trout face upstream into the current, they're less likely to see you approaching them. But even in larger rivers, you may wanna work upstream. It's just easier to get to trout and it allows you to make short, accurate casts. In bigger rivers, you may wanna work downstream. If the river is wide enough, you can work downstream and not spook fish because you're often separated by distance and current from the fish, so you can approach them from upstream. Trout seem to feel more secure when feeding over deeper water or separated from you by a current seam, and you can get away with approaches that would be tricky in a smaller river. Also, it's harder to push against the current in a big river, so working downstream might just be easier on your legs. Also, you push less water ahead of you by sliding downstream with the current, and those waves you push ahead of you can frighten fish and turn them off the feed. But pay attention to mud and silt you stir up when working downstream. Sometimes the mud and silt you stir up can get fish feeding, but most times it turns them off. One of the best ways to cover a lot of water is to swing a wet fly or soft tackle. I had always just cast the wet fly across and down, mend it a couple times, and then let it swing across the current. But there is a much better way to fish soft tackles. Here, Guide B.J. Gerhardt of Three Rivers Ranch teaches me how he fishes soft tackles. I started out swinging soft tackles the way I usually do, swinging all the way across the current and just got a small fish. Then he taught me a much better way that presents the fly in a more natural manner. 
So I do a lot of mending to keep it on the same line. I pick a specific water current with constant mending. And then at the end, I almost do a reverse roll cast, like flick line, and I throw slack to where everything is now upriver in that same lane. Mm -hmm. And then she runs perfectly straight. And then when actually you hold tight and point your rod that way, yeah. the line stays static in that current yep. and raises everything up and then we'll hold it. So to do the swing is a roll cast, a snap T, roll cast out to where it's straight out in front of you, give it a slight mend, wait till it gets 45 degrees, then throw line and mend out to keep it on the same line, hold the rod out following the line and the leader, pointing the rod and holding tight. And then once it goes down, Mend a little bit to the left, let it come down and hold the rod up slowly, drop it, another left, and hold the rod up tight again. Huh? There's a better fish, I think. Yeah, let yeah. them line. There's good ones in here, big ones. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it works. <laughs> Didn't look that big when he rolled there. They're hot. They're yeah. They are feisty and fat. They're going to be like footballs right now. Oh, I got Okay. Him. Yeah. I think now, of course, now he's out here. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. I'll just chase him up. Here he comes. Pretty rainbow. Yeah. Purple haze. Purple haze. Whoa. Once water temperatures rise above 50 degrees, almost any type of fly-in presentation will work. Of course, allowing for the whims of the trout. I think the best way to teach you about prospecting for trout is to have you follow me through the process. Here I am in a river I have never fished without a guide, fishing some water that looks good. Will I manage to fool any? So we're on a small river in Wyoming. It's late in the season. The water is low and it's very clear. I'm gonna start with a dry fly because I know the fish can see it no matter where they are. And just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna hang a little nymph on the end in case the fish aren't inclined to take food off the surface. We're at the head of a long, shallow riffle that doesn't look like much down below here. It's uh, really shallow, probably holds a little tiny trout, but not much. But right up at the head is a little bit deeper, slower pocket that might hold some fish. And it's a spot that a lot of people might pass up. So I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly with my dry dropper and see what happens. So I gave this a pretty good shot. I gave it maybe 40 casts, probably more than I should have. Um, I hooked one little cutthroat, but I'm just not feeling it here. And I see that there's a much better pool up around the bend. So I'm gonna move on and see what's happening up there. So we've moved on and um, there's a lot more to work with in this pool. There's a couple of deep slots behind me, one on this bank, one over on the other bank. Then there's a little shallow area with a bar and then there's where the, where the bend comes into the river and there's probably a deep pocket in there. So we got some more stuff to work with and I'll probably spend some more time in this pool. Now I'm gonna stick with a dry dropper here. I don't have any better option. I think it's still gonna work and I did have that little cutthroat down below eat the nymph. So I'm gonna stick with the same dry dropper until nature shows me something different. When you're prospecting, you don't really know where the fish are, you don't see any fish feeding. Always work the near water first because you never know when there might be some fish right beside you. There's a fish, finally. I know that I've been fishing over fish all the way up through here. I know they're here. 
Um, but until we came to this really beautiful deep pool here, we didn't see anything. This nice cutthroat um, ate the dry fly, nothing on the nymph. Um, so anyway, uh, what I'm gonna do is release this fish, and then I'm gonna, I think, put on a bigger nymph. Maybe the fish are looking for something a little bigger subsurface, because I know that there's gotta be a pile of fish in this pool here. There he goes. There's a fish on the nymph, finally. Uh oh. Is that a whitey? Nope, it's trout. So I knew there had to be fish down there feeding on nymphs, and I put on a, a bigger, slightly heavier nymph, because this pool's pretty deep to try to get down to the bottom. So that bigger nymph did work where the little zebra midge didn't work well for me. I think I'll keep, keep sticking to this for a while. Tell all your friends how good that nymph tasted. Come on, gotta be a fish right there. Oh, oh my God. That was a big fish that just took a swipe at that dry fly. I have a fairly big dry fly on because I can see it and I'm using it as an indicator. But the fact that that big fish came and took a swipe at it but didn't eat it makes me think maybe I should go to a little bit smaller dry fly. I'll stick with this for a little bit more, but I think I'm gonna switch pretty soon to a smaller dry. So that's a good indication that you've gone a little bit too big when the fish swirls at it but doesn't take. All right, I've given this pool a pretty good working over. One fish landed on a dry, one big fish rolled on the big dry, one fish caught on the nymph, one fish caught and midstream released on the nymph, but I know there's more fish in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to a smaller dry fly and a medium-sized nymph, see if that makes a difference. I'm not ready to give up. I'm gonna give this pool a little bit of rest. I'm gonna back off, let the fish settle down. I don't think I spooked them much, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna, uh, I don't wanna hang right here by the pool. I'm gonna back off a little bit and let things settle down. Okay, I switched out to something a little more mayfly looking. Still a fairly big dry fly, but a little bit more mayfly looking. It's still early in the morning, and um, there are probably aren't any grasshoppers or any terrestrials falling in the river, so we'll go with that in a medium-sized nymph, see what works out in this pool. Ooh! I think that was that big fish, too. I definitely don't see it now, do you? Oh, that's why. So I'm caught in a branch up there. I know there's more fish in here, so I'm not gonna go and get it. Probably too deep to wade in there anyways. Just gonna break it off, switch flies, try something else. All right, so I broke off those last two flies. Uh, so I'm gonna try something a little bit different. I've got a good old trusty parachute Adams on here, medium size, size 14, dry fly. And then I did see a little yellow stone that was landing on my arm. So a little yellow stone fly. So I put on this um, chartreuse copper john um, because it looks a lot like the nymphs of those little stone flies. Oh, there's another fish on the, whoa, that's not a white fish. On the copper john. Uh-oh. Oh, he had me in the roots. A little side pressure here. He's out of danger. Frisky fish, whatever. Oh, nice cutthroat. So noticing that little stonefly on my arm probably paid off because I put on a, a nymph that sort of imitated that stonefly nymph in size and color and uh, 
produce this nice cutthroat. Yeah, that's a beautiful fish. Beautiful cutthroat on the Copper John. Although you'll learn more from the wisdom and experience of a guide, it's also a thrill to catch fish on your own, exploring new waters or rediscovering familiar ones. Keep your options open and experiment with different techniques until you discover what works, or maybe just what technique gives you the most pleasure. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery.